just want to get my sermon out. I would like to talk to you this afternoon about crackpot Christians. Crackpot Christians. If I would greet you today and say to you, good afternoon, crackpots, you might be very offended. And you might even consider walking out. Because I, might, I for sure would not like somebody to call me a crackpot. But before you leave, and before you get offended, hear me out. Crackpot Christians. What is the meaning of crackpot? Well, it's got a very interesting history. Um, it's, it originated in um, a little town or a little village in Yorkshire uh, with the name of crackpot. And the Vikings, many, many years ago, uh, in the 12th century, they decided on the name for this place because um, at that time the village was, was called Craigpot, which derives from a Norse term, a kraka, uh, which means a crack, and kraw, which means a pot. And later on, um, it got the meaning of uh, somebody who is a bit faulty, who is a bit weird. So today we, we use it in that sense. If we say, well, that guy is a real crackpot, we, we actually mean um, his brain is cracked. He's, he's, he's a bit weird. But there's another sense in what I would like to use this term, crackpot. And as, I, as we progress through the sermon this afternoon, I hope you will understand if I, uh, if I say to you and to me, we are, we are quite a few crackpots. I don't wish to mean we are weird. Of course, Christians are sometimes very weird. But there's a different meaning. So instead of an insult, I hope it becomes a message of hope. In the readings today, we've read about Paul, who is referring to Christians as people who are like uh, pots. Yet in that pot, there's something very valuable. In the Old Testament reading, we read about brokenness. And then I would like to add to that a gospel reading from Mark 14. In the gospel reading, I would like to take you to Bethany. In the little town of Bethany, there's a story of Jesus coming to town to the house of a man named Simon the leper who lived in the village of Bethany. And this was an occasion where people were eating. It was, a, it was a, a, maybe a lunch or a dinner, we don't exactly know. But they were eating and uh, they were enjoying themselves. Now, eating in those days uh, did not happen by sitting at a table. They were reclining at the table. So with one elbow on the table, they would eat with the other hand, the right hand. Then the whole atmosphere of that dinner or that, that uh, occasion was interrupted by a woman standing behind Jesus. And she opened a vase, a pot. Actually, she broke the thing. And she poured out very precious oil on Jesus' head. And it, got, it, it caused quite a stir. Because usually it was that uh, the custom to pour a few drops of perfume on a guest when he arrived at a house or when he sat down for a meal. But what she did was extraordinary. It was out of, out of their minds, uh, trying to conceive what, what she was doing. She broke the whole flask of these very, very precious oil that was maybe coming from India in those days. 
and she anointed his head with the entire content of this verse. Well, there might be a few reasons why she did it. It was a custom in the, in the Middle East that if a glass was used by a distinguished guest, it was broken so that it would never again be touched by the hand of a lesser person. But she did more than that. She came and she gave every single thing she had. Her whole pension was in that, that pot, in that flask. In those days, the normal wage of a person, daily wage, was about three pennies. And it was reckoned that what she did was the equal of about 300 denarii. That is a whole lot of money. That was the total of her riches, richness. So there were a few objections. She broke it and she poured it all out on Jesus. And the gospel writer uses a very interesting word to describe her action. There were two words for good. The one is agathos, which is morally good. And then there's another word, kalos, which means lovely. And the gospel writer uses the word kalos. It was a lovely act. It was an act out of love. But the focus is actually that she broke it and gave it all. And then we go over to Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is talking also about the content of a pot. In the Corinthians account, we see Paul talking about jars of clay with treasures inside. And he says, for God who said, and he starts off with the imperative, with the command, he says, let light shine out of darkness as the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God in the face of Christ. And then he says, but we have this precious treasure in earthen vessels of human frailty so that the grandeur and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God and not from ourselves. There's a link between these two stories. The first is that we are vessels, we are pots. The Bible compares us with pots. I think this one was made by somebody here. Um, Maybe a year, year or two ago when we visited uh, some place outside in our cultural trip. But the fact is, we are like these pots, jars of clay. And how fragile we are. Our bodies and our minds go through all the phases of life, birth, childhood, young adulthood, late adulthood, middle age, and then old age. And no matter how we try to stop or pause these, uh, this aging process, the signs of age do appear. And eventually, we die. The jar of clay falls to the ground, and soil returns to soil, ashes to ashes. Nothing is left. No matter who or what man is on earth, he's still mortal. He's still the victim of the processes that we're subjected to. We're still subjected to the chances and changes of human life. Pascal says, a drop of water or a breath of air can kill him. It's interesting 
in the Middle East, in the old traditions of the Middle East, when a Roman general comes back from the battlefield, and even if he had a huge victory, he won a victory, the people had some way to remind him that life is fragile, that he should not boast too much in his victory. So, usually after a victory, there was this parade with the general and his soldiers marching through the town. And first, as he rode in a chariot with a crown held over his head, the people not only shouted their applause to him, but they also shouted, look behind you and remember, you will die. And also with the soldier, at the very end of the procession, uh, there came the conquering general's own soldiers, and they did two things as they marched. They sang songs in the general's praise, but they also shouted jests and insults to keep him from too much pride. They actually wanted to tell him, you're a jar of clay. We all are. We're fragile. We're actually nothing but pots, jars of clay. So if we are jars of clay, you and I, if we are here the one day and the next day, we're gone. We know that life has surrounded us with infirmity. But there's a but. And Paul's, Paul comes with that but. And he says, no, although we are jars of clay, although we are fragile, we must remember inside this pot, inside this pot there's something so valuable, there's a treasure immensely precious and valuable. In this earthen vessel, which it's itself is weak and worthless, there is something so precious. What is so precious in it? He says there is light in this jar. God has deposited in us light the light of the world. He says, let light, he that says, let light shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory and majesty of God. If I say to you, you are pots. We are just jars of clay. It's not an insult. It's to tell you we are fragile. But inside, it's some pots look better than other pots. Some pots are older, some pots are younger. We all are different. But inside, Paul says, there's something wonderful, something beautiful inside of us. He says, if Christ is in you, the same Paul says, Christ is in you the hope of glory in us he has deposited his love paul is very clear about that that god has deposited in this jar of clay the fullness of his love he has poured it out. He uses a word that is so strong. God has extravagantly poured out His love on us and in us. I'm a recipient of all the love of God that He can give. I'm the recipient and you are the recipient of all of God's grace that he can bestow. If I die one day, there's one word that can be written over my life. 
and that's the word grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. God has poured out His grace upon us extravagantly, wastefully. God has deposited in us hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can live without air for three minutes. You can live without water for three days. You can live without food for maybe a month. You cannot live one second without hope. If I don't have hope, I die. God has poured out in us His forgiveness, His glory. Freely you have received, freely you should give. We are not people with all the answers. Thank God for that. We are not people who are perfect. Thank God for that. But God has poured out in us His own life. How precious can you get? His life. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Can you see? Like the woman pouring out, breaking her vase, breaking this little pot with that, that unbelievably precious oil. We have that oil. We have something similar in us that far, far exceeds the value of this old pot. We are not the elite of God. We are the servants of God. We are the recipients. This pot cannot, cannot generate all of that on its own. He has to receive it. He has to be the recipient of that. But in the third place, we can keep it all in the pot. We can take this pot and put it in a very safe place. I can have the most precious oil in the world, the most precious or valuable uh, content in the whole world, and I can put it somewhere on display. What will it mean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that's where the psalmist comes in. And he says, well, at some point, that, and that's life. At some point, brokenness becomes part of our gospel. If this pot is not cracked, if this pot is not broken, it will be just something on display. It will be beautiful. It will be something that we can admire and we can, we can look at it and we can even uh, show it to our friends. But this is life. And at times, life breaks us. At times, life shatters us. And the psalm reading is all about brokenness. My sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, God, will not despise. The heart of the gospel is brokenness. When we will have Holy Communion this afternoon, we take the bread and we break it. And as you come to receive the bread, you come with open palms. Because we receive it. We don't take it. We receive it. And then the person who serves you will show it to you. And this is the body of Christ. Broken for you. You have to see it. And then he or she will put it in your hands. Brokenness. 
Jesus was broken for you and for me. And when we come and receive the wine, the wine is a symbol of brokenness. We dip that, that bread into the wine. And the celebrant says to us, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Brokenness is part of life. We try so hard to avoid brokenness. That's natural response to brokenness. And if you're broken, sometimes we fuse with that. Sometimes we embrace that brokenness so much that we, we become part of the brokenness. The fact is, brokenness is part of our life. When Jesus ministered to the crowds, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them and he fed the crowds. What am I telling you this afternoon? Brothers and sisters, a crackpot Christian, it's not a weird Christian, a crackpot Christian is the Christian who knows without the cracks, the oil cannot flow. Without the cracks, the oil cannot flow.